normal size bear. All right, well, uh, is this on? Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here at the Kennan Institute. Uh, I'm Matt Rojansky, director of Kennan, uh, for those who don't know. Uh, before we start and uh, I introduce our uh, distinguished speaker for the morning, I want to thank a few colleagues uh, who've made this possible. Uh, here at the Wilson Center, we work together with the Canada Institute and the Women in Public Service Project uh, to promote and set up this event. I also want to thank the Embassy of Canada in Washington for their help promoting the event. Uh, and of course, uh, a big thanks to Barry Jackson, who's a trustee of the Wilson Center and is um, hiding somewhere in this room. There he is. All right. Uh, Barry insisted that I not give the elaborate introduction, which I think is a sign that he is a man who in Washington needs no introduction. I'm not sure if that's a dubious distinction these days, but in any case, uh, thanks, Barry. Um, so today's event, as you know, is continuing the Euromaidan through healthcare reform, a conversation with Ukraine's Minister of Health. I think in most contexts, uh, connecting a dramatic political transformation with healthcare reform uh, would probably be a stretch, but I think in the Ukrainian and in the American context, it makes perfect sense. So it's great that we're having that conversation this morning. Um, let me uh, offer just a, a few words of background on Dr. Suprun, who I know is uh, well known to Ukraine watchers. Um, she was, in fact, uh, born here in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, she received her medical degree from Michigan State um, and uh, practiced radiology in Detroit as well as in New York City, uh, where she was vice medical director and partner owner of Manhattan Women's Imaging. Um, she is an assistant clinical professor of pathology at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Um, but in 2013, she and her husband, Marco, moved to Ukraine, where both were on the Maidan during the Revolution of Dignity in Kiev. Uh, she worked in medical services on the Euromaidan, which led to her position uh, at the Ukrainian World Congress, uh, and later the founding of Patriot Defense, a non-government organization providing tactical medicine training to Ukraine's service members. Uh, in 2015, President Poroshenko conferred citizenship on Suprun and her spouse, saying, your efforts have, have saved thousands of lives. Uh, Suprun, after that, became advisor to the Committee on Public Health of the Vikhovna Rada uh, before being appointed first deputy minister of the health ministry uh, in Ukraine and finally acting minister of health of Ukraine in August of last year. And it's still, is it still an acting status or is it? Yeah. Okay. All right. Wonderful. So uh, Dr. Suprun is going to start us out with uh, 15, 20 minutes of comments and then we'll open the floor for questions and we have plenty of time. Hello, good morning. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Barry, because I know that you had a lot to do with this, organizing this event. Um, I'm uh, very pleased to be here today to talk about the medical reforms that we're doing in Ukraine. Ukraine has been independent for 26 years, but no reforms have been done in the medical uh, field since the start of uh, independence. We continue to have the same Semashko Soviet system of medicine where we finance the hospitals themselves to keep them open. We pay for hospital beds to exist, but we don't actually finance any of the treatment or any of the services provided. Um, in the United States, everyone is used to an insurance type of plan where you go to a doctor, you go to a hospital, you have some kind of insurance, whether it's Medicare insurance for older people or whether it's uh, insurance that's bought through your, uh, the, your place of employment. You show your insurance card, they may be a copay, but you have that financial guarantee that it will be paid for by the insurance company, by the government if it's Medicare. In Ukraine, that does not exist. At this time, the small amount of financing that's available for health care in the budget, since there's an economic crisis in Ukraine, there's only 2.6% of the budget that's being used for health care, and it's enough to keep open all of the very old and crumbling infrastructure, which is very heavy. There are twice as many hospitals per 10,000 population, one and a half times as many doctors, and one and a half times as many beds per 10,000 population compared to all of the European countries combined. We pay for the infrastructure to exist. We pay the salaries, very low salaries, for medical personnel to work within these hospitals and these medical facilities, but we don't actually pay for any medical services to be provided for the patient. So the patient comes into the hospital and has to pay the doctor 
for seeing them, has to buy all of the uh, disposable materials if they have an operation or they're having some kind of procedure. They have to pay for all of their own medicines, all of the pharmaceuticals that are used. They sometimes even have to pay for the food and the linens on the beds when they come into the hospitals. Every year, 640,000 Ukrainians go bankrupt because of medical uh, care that they have to sell their house, they have to sell their car, their families have to provide um, money for them to be able to pay for medical services. It's a really huge problem in Ukraine when it comes to financing. That's only one part of the puzzle, though, because there's also a problem with the quality of care. Since there isn't any uh, financial incentive for doctors to improve themselves, there's no financial rewards for going to conferences or improving uh, their uh, medical expertise or their professionalism, many doctors aren't that interested in uh, learning new methods of care, in uh, following international protocols of care. And um, I wanted to present to you a couple of numbers that are very um, indicative of how uh, the quality of care in Ukraine is uh, not at the same level as it is in a lot of other uh, Western countries. Um, the first number I want to talk about is 103. In Ukraine, after 11 grades of school, because there isn't 12 grades, uh, the, the graduates take uh, standardized exams, sort of like an ACT or an SAT test, and the highest score you can get is a 200. If you want to go to law school, you have to have a 180. If you want to go to engineering school, you have to have about a 130. The number for medical school is 103, the lowest of all professions. So we have the lowest scoring students applying for medical school. Second number I want to say, 37%. In this past year, one of our deputy ministers, Oleksandr Linchowski, he's a thoracic surgeon in Ukraine. He has traveled uh, into uh, to European countries, to the United States for conferences. He keeps up on all of the most current trends in medicine. As an um, evaluation of how well Ukrainian students do compared to U.S. medical students, we have a memorandum of cooperation with the United States Medical Licensing Exam, USMLE. That's three exams that are taken by medical students in their second year, in their fourth year, and after their first year of internship in the U.S. so that they can get licensed into medicine. So we have a similar process in Ukraine where there's step one, step two, and step three. However, the questions are written in the old Soviet medical style. So what we did was we took 50 questions from the US MLE and we translated them into Ukrainian and put them into the Ukrainian exam of step three. We told the students they will not be graded on these uh, questions, that they're only, it's only a test, an experiment to see how well they would do. Guess what the average score was? 37%. The highest score was uh, 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 the highest score was gotten by our deputy minister, Oleksandr Linchowski, who scored a 90%. The third number I want to tell you is 0 0.4. If you look in uh, on Wikipedia and you look up uh, peer-reviewed medical journals and you look at the language in which they're written, 99% of them are written in English. English is now the language of medicine. All medical, international medical conferences are in English. Most textbooks are in English. Most, uh, most, most physicians and those that want to be involved in the most uh, current practices need to read English, read English journals, and uh, have an understanding of the language. So the third number, 0.4%, is the number of Ukrainian physicians that work in polyclinics that speak English. So they get most of their information from either Ukrainian or more likely Russian language journals and Russian language medicine. Not the most current and not the most modern. Those three numbers are indicative of the quality of care that we have in Ukraine. So we have a problem with financing. We need to finance it more efficiently. Right now we're paying for the infrastructure. We're not actually paying for anything to do with patient care. Secondly, we need to increase the quality of medicine. So we need to start with the medical students, start teaching them differently, start demanding English language, and requiring for physicians to become licensed, because in Ukraine there is no licensing of medical, uh, of physicians or of nurses. The third thing that's very important is a difference in public health versus individual health of every patient. In Ukraine, 99% of all financing and all attention is paid to the individual uh, treatment for each patient, and there's very little attention and very little financing paid to public health. 
What's public health? Public health is to care for the health of the entire population, to make sure that all your children are uh, vaccinated, to make sure that you have a program in place to decrease trans fats so that there aren't as many cardiovascular disease, uh, heart attacks, and strokes, to make sure that there's not, uh, to decrease the amount of sugar being eaten in, in, um, uh, in, uh, so that patients don't uh, get diabetes. These are big programs. Uh, doing prevention of infectious diseases like HIV, like tuberculosis, like hepatitis C. In Ukraine, there are no public health programs because there hasn't been any financing given to it and any attention. So we're, the third thing we're changing is we're starting to focus more on public health, talking about prevention of disease and not only treatment of disease. That is both responsible, fiscally responsible, because it's for every one hryvnia we put into preventative medicine, we can save 10 hryvnia in uh, treatment of disease. It's also better quality of life, because instead of patients being sick, and in Ukraine it's quite common for 35-year-old and 40-year-old men to have heart attacks at that age. Instead of having people who are disabled, unable to work, we can increase productivity and we can help Ukrainians stay well longer. And third, um, Ukrainians die on average 11 years younger than their European neighbors. So with preventative medicine, we can prolong life so that we have Ukrainians that are living better quality lives, are more productive, and they can live longer. So why for 26 years has Ukraine done nothing to change the system and allowed it to get to this state where we're desperate to change the system? Every year, 136,000 Ukrainians die of preventable causes. We, every year, over 120,000 less Ukrainians are born than die. There's been a loss of almost 10 million of the population since independence. This is a huge problem. This is a national security issue. This has gotten to the point where we really need to do something to change it or else Ukraine as a nation, as a country, is slowly disappearing. This past year, when we came into the uh, Ministry of Health, we introduced some very radical changes. We showed how we can finance healthcare differently. We can take the money that's in the budget, not asking for additional taxes, not asking for additional money from employers, but first proving that we're able to more efficiently use the funds that are available, and then asking for more financing. We want to take the financing and we want to pay in the primary care level for emergency medicine and for palliative care. It's 100% coverage for everyone. That's 80% of all of medical care, 100% coverage by the budgetary funds. And guess what? We can do it. There's enough money in the budget. Then if you have planned surgeries, second, uh, higher level specialized care and, and um, uh, hospital care, there will be some sort of copay because we're being honest. The government doesn't have enough money to pay 100% for all of health care. We will ask patients to cover some of the costs, but they'll know exactly how much they're supposed to pay. It won't be different for every person who walks in the way that it is now, but they'll be transparent, set fees for each of the procedures, and if they're unable to pay, there are different programs that will help them pay. There'll be uh, subsidies for those who economically can't afford it. In the law that we presented, we also have uh, 100 percent coverage for all soldiers who've been injured in the Russian-Ukrainian war and who have become disabled. They will never have to pay for their health care for the rest of their lives. We also are working with industries such as the National Railroad where they have a, their own separate uh, health care system and we're working with them so that they take the funding that they put into their health care system and create a health insurance that will then cover any copay that both their employees, which there are 380,000 of them, employees and their families will be able to have full coverage um, while they're working at the uh, railroad and for all of their pensioners to have full coverage. And we're also working on different plans with local communities so that they can also help to have the citizens that are in the city or in the town or in the uh, oblast so that they have extra coverage in case they need to have help because economically they can't afford to pay for the uh, copay that's associated with the medicine. We continue to have additional programs. We do national procurement of medicines. We also do sp specific programs for tuberculosis, for HIV, for hepatitis C. We also have separate programs for oncology so that we can help patients pay for the medicines in case they can't afford them themselves. All of these things will help to create financial guarantees for our Ukrainian citizens. 
they will no longer be afraid to go to the doctor when they become sick because they think they'll be financially ruined. And not only will they be ruined, but their family will be ruined. We are providing those financial guarantees so that people feel safer. We're providing transparency in what the fees will be so that everyone will be aware of how much they have to pay if they have to pay anything. We will create uh, co anti-corruption um, procedures so that the physicians who are receiving payment from the national health insurance will not be allowed to take money from the patients on the side. Right now, they can take money from patients and the only way that they are punished is if a criminal case is brought, ag brought against them. Most patients don't wanna go to the police and put in a criminal case against their doctors. There is no recourse for us. We can't tell them to stop doing it because the only recourse we have is criminal cases. With the new system in place, the physicians in the hospitals will be signing a contract with the National Health Insurance. If they are taking money from patients outside of the system that is put in place, the contract will be annulled and they will no longer receive financing. So there'll be financial consequences for them to uh, continue acting the way that they do now. How is this going to help each and every patient in Ukraine? First of all, they'll have financial guarantees. Secondly, they'll have quality of care because we will be requiring for payment that the physicians follow international protocols of care, uh, medical care. And third, it will allow Ukrainians to have hope because at this point, they have no hope that the system will ever get better. We pass the laws that are in parliament at this time and the patients will understand that in a year, in two years, things are gonna get better. Short-term programs such as reimbursement of medicines for cardiovascular disease, bronchial asthma, and um, for uh, type two diabetes are already in place. Investment into hospitals to make them uh, better, the ones that are working well, that have a lot of patients, investment programs to provide equipment, to provide um, uh, reconstruction so that those hospitals that are chosen to be the ones that will be giving patients the most uh, services, those will be um, high quality hospitals, level one trauma centers that will have 24 hours of care, 24, uh, seven days a week, uh, 365 days a year. Patients will start to have that hope that their uh, government cares for them. You know, there's a conference going on in a different part of town right now called the Report Card on Ukraine. It's an organization called the uh, Center for U.S.-Ukraine Relations. And every year they do this report card. And that report card is to see whether Ukraine has become a mature nation state. A mature nation state is one that cares for social programs. It's the one that starts looking at the needs of the people and not just the need to exist. At this time, Ukraine is fighting for its very existence. There's a war in Eastern Ukraine. There's a Russian aggressor that doesn't want Ukraine to continue to exist, that doesn't want things like reforms in medicine to happen because it will make the people healthier, happier, and more open to progress, to reform, to changing. The oligarchs, the Russian uh, Federation, our Russian uh, enemy and its proxies, they would like for Ukrainians to stay poor. They would like for them to stay unhappy, unsatisfied with their government, and die young. And it's a civilizational issue. Ukraine needs to do this so that we can continue to exist. Ukraine needs to do this because we want to show uh, as a government, we want to show our people that we have become a mature nation state and we care for pension reform, we care for health care reform, and we care for educational reform. And third, it's really a question of what's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. It's hard and it will be painful because all reform is difficult, but it's the right thing to do. So my last pitch for you is this. We presented a law, 6327, in Parliament. It has passed through the first reading, and we are now waiting for the second reading. It passed by 227 votes. We needed 226. We fought tooth and nail through four times of voting before we could even muster up the 227 votes. Those who support us, the Prime Minister and the Cabinet of Ministers from the very beginning, the President more recently in the National Reforms Council, 
presidential party, uh, Bloc Partia Poroshenko, uh, Narodny Front, which is um, uh, the party that is uh, from the previous Prime Minister Yatsenyuk, and also Samopomich from Western Ukraine. These three parties voted 100%, uh, 87%, 85% for these laws. Other parties, not so much. They uh, seem to think that the laws are, uh, that Ukraine isn't ready yet for reform. After 26 years, after losing 10 million population, after our infrastructure is falling apart, after people are literally dying in the streets because our emergency medical system doesn't work, they feel Ukraine is still not ready for these kinds of reforms. I can tell you Ukraine is. We have great support from civil society, from patient organizations, from the NGOs that are anti-corruption NGOs, because everything that we're doing in the healthcare reform is really aimed at preventing corruption in the system, using the financing that's available efficiently without it having been stolen or used in corrupt practices, and creating a system where Ukrainians uh, have transparent information that is available to each and every one of them and knowing what their guarantees are and how they can get into the system and receive the help that they need. So 6327, the last number I'll tell you about. 6327, a very important law that needs to pass in Parliament. Uh, the President of Ukraine is apparently coming uh, on Sunday for a three-day visit here to the United States. It would be great if we here in the United States can um, make sure that he hears from our leaders uh, of, the, of the United States, from our leaders in the Ukrainian parliament who are here right now, our speaker is here right now, so that the president hears that there is great support for this type of reform because it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much, Dr. Suprun. Um, we have plenty of time for questions, and I should have mentioned earlier that we are on a live stream, so uh, we, we may have inputs uh, from the web as well, and certainly people can, can watch this session recorded later. Um, that was uh, a very impressive tour to horizon. I wish uh, we had healthcare reform uh, advocates and officials in our country who were as clear-minded about the priorities, because I actually think a lot of the problems you described resonated. Um, uh, thank God, not all of them, but uh, but many of them really did. And I want to ask about uh, three specific areas, um, uh, some actually that I've even experienced myself uh, in Ukraine and in the region um, that, that still seem problematic, but that maybe you're working on. Um, one is, is very unique to Ukraine's current situation, and that's, you know, you mentioned, um, just as we have essentially, uh, you know, lifelong coverage for veterans. Uh, but uh, Ukraine has also had a conflict with an unusual constellation of, of people doing the fighting, including kind of volunteers who are not part of any official structures, people who uh, fought and uh, were even wounded, et cetera, in, in essentially non-front context, right? Maidan volunteers, et cetera. So uh, is there, I guess the first question is, is there a, a framework for dealing with the many different layers of kind of informal, other than soldiers in uniform, people who are effectively veterans of the conflict, uh, and there's an element of a mental health uh, question there when you talk about kind of public health, healthy lifestyles. There's a, uh, a, con a concept called uchasnik um, bojovik di, someone who has taken part in um, uh, conflict, in a conflict situation, who's been involved in the conflict. This is uh, certain criteria that need to be met so that you receive this status. Um, those who were on the Maidan and who came under fire on Maidan also can receive this status, as can any of the volunteer battalion members and those that are currently um, in, currently within the military structures. There's a, a five different military structures in Ukraine, and they can all receive that. There are certain criteria that need to be met. That is that you came under fire and that you have at least uh, a commander who writes a letter that says that you were there and a couple of witnesses who say that you were present. Um, there's a, a bit of a uh, a bit of a uh, question in that because um, some people don't have enough evidence to be able to show that they haven't been able to come up with it. So we work very hard at the ministry because we can give them that status through a, a medical reason. So if they w received care, say after the Euromaidan when uh, there were shootings. Um, and they were treated in Kyiv hospitals, if we have the medical record of that patient who has gunshot wounds from that date in the hospital, 
then we can prove that they were present and they had been shot on the Maidan and they can receive that status. So in the ministry, we try to use as, uh, the, the information that we have as much as possible so that we can provide this status for those who deserve it. Of course, there's always those who try to get the status without deserving it, such as some of the generals in the Ministry of Defense who you know, take a car and pass through a couple of block posts and then come back out and say, well, I was in the zone, I should have this status. They really need to have taken part in some sort of, um, uh, some sort of care, uh, under fire so that they get the status that they should have. Um, there are five different militaries in Ukraine, and each one of them has their own veterans sort of association, and there's a single veterans association that's under the Ministry of Social Policy. So we're trying to gather all of them into one place so that we have an accurate list of those who, who need care. That veterans administration under the Ministry of Social Policy is also one, the one that is tasked with helping with the psychological issues um, of those soldiers who are returning home. There are a lot of programs on uh, prevention of, uh, or on treatment of PTSD. Um, just for you to know that uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, is a very serious psychological or psychiatric illness. It's not a term to bandy about freely. This is a diagnosis that uh, you have to have, uh, out of eight different symptoms, you have to have at least six of them. They have to be ongoing for over a month. There are certain conditions that predispose to it, having lived through a, a trauma. And actually, PTSD is most common in, uh, after women who, in women who have been raped. That's actually the highest percentage of uh, people who have experienced a trauma and, and have PTSD. Soldiers are actually second uh, under that. Right now, we've uh, created a center for mental health at the Ministry of uh, Health, where we will be um, uh, providing certification of psychologists and psychiatrists who are allowed to treat PTSD, because uh, many things are not uh, the, what they seem in Ukraine. You can't always compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges, because sometimes those apples are actually oranges. Um, in Ukraine, psychologists are people who finished a three-year associate's degree, 21-year-olds, you know, that have a diploma that says psychologist. It's not a master's degree or PhD who has clinical psychology, has a certain amount of training, so that they can provide care. They know the protocols and they know uh, the diagnostic criteria. So we're, uh, we created the Center for Mental Health so that we can bring up the level of those psychologists and psychiatrists who work in Ukraine, certify the ones that are, um, have taken the proper courses and have the proper clinical experience to be able to provide care for those that uh, need psychological care. But much can be done on the community level. Um, from the returning soldiers, only about one or two percent of them are actually gonna have serious symptoms of PTSD. Most of them have normal post-traumatic stress. You've experienced something traumatic. We all have it if we've ever experienced the death of a loved one. You have, at that point, a post-traumatic stress reaction. It's normal. Just as a soldier returning home from war, it's normal for them to have a stress reaction. They left their home, went into a uh, conflict situation, saw a lot of things that most people don't want to see, came home, and they are no longer the same person. They can't be and they never will be. And what we need to do is help them and their families understand that this is the new him or her, and that we need to accept that and let's build our lives, follow our lives, continue our lives with this new person. Um, that's a very difficult thing to get across to most of the population there's also a very big stigma in Ukraine when it comes to psychology or psychiatry because in the Soviet Union, dissidents were put into psychiatric hospitals and treated as if they uh, had a psychiatric illness. So there's a big stigma when it comes to psychology or psychiatry in Ukraine because nobody wants to go there. It was used as an, a, a form of imprisonment rather than a form of treatment. So we have a lot of, uh, a big fight ahead of us. Um, you know, you had mentioned also on the, uh, uh, with the Maidan, that um, those that had been um, uh, shot on the Maidan and those that had taken part, that they should also be recognized as veterans. Also, the people who took part in Maidan have the same sort of post-traumatic stress. Um, they, many of them went right from there into volunteer battalions or became volunteers and started helping on the front lines. And there, uh, that volunteer uh, community has kind of not, um, not been helped when it comes to these uh, psychological support. They're the ones that have really a big problem. They keep 
helping and they want to help, but they really need a lot of help themselves. And I think that that's something that we need to concentrate a little bit more on because we really don't want to have an entire generation of people who will be um, unable to have normal relationships, unable to move on with their lives, to hold jobs and to uh, be productive because of what they experience. That's uh, really encouraging, uh, at least from the standpoint of, of uh, you know, the, the health ministry's perspective. Um, and we certainly wish you uh, success and have heard what you said about the, the, the pending law in the RADA. Um, one, one more question from me before I open it up. Uh, and this is really based on personal experience. You know, um, like many of us, I've spent a lot of time in Ukraine and also in the region, so I've experienced all of the uh, unpleasantnesses of kind of the classic Soviet uh, uh, medical care system, which someone there once described to me as, well, it's military medicine, right? They'll save your life, but you won't be very comfortable and you might have to buy your own drinking water, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but then the result of that is that, of course, not everyone is completely dependent. Some people have more resources. And so you get the stratification, even in the unreformed context, where it's sort of, you know, if you're poor, you go with the, the basic free service or the semi-free, you know, kind of pay the bribe on the side. Uh, if you're a little bit wealthier, you can pay for the private clinics, which exist all over the place of varying, sometimes dubious quality. And then there's the kind of almost self-medivac phenomenon, right? I'm not talking about necessarily like you're a foreigner who is formally medevaced, you know, to, to Germany or something like that, but you basically sort of almost health tourism, right? You plan your need to do really serious medical procedures around your trip to Bulgaria or whatever it is. How do you see the reform addressing both the, the actual, um, the kind of reality of stratification of healthcare between publicly provided and publicly kind of regulated services and then the kind of informal private health economy um, and then also what the, if you will, the sort of social political implications of that will be when, you know, people who can't afford it are looking at people who can afford it and just simply enjoy better health care. I mean, that's been a sensitive issue in our country. Uh, there is a stratification. Um, there is even a stratification within the public health uh, sector. Um, there, in Ukraine, there used to be 19 different um, public health sectors, 19. Now it's down to about 12. But say there's the Ministry of Health, which is about 60, 65 percent of all of the medical facilities are under the Ministry of Health. The military, each of the militaries has his own, have their own medical structures. So the Ministry of Defense has one, the Ministry of Interior has three, because they have the Border Guard Service, the National Guard Service, and the uh, police. They each have their own. And then the um, uh, SBU has its own, and they each have their own. There's also a special one just for high-level government officials. That's left over from the Soviet Union when the Communist Party has its own hospitals and everyone else had to go to the public ones. This is called DUS. It's uh, Feofania, which is a hospital in Kyiv, uh, is kind of the poster hospital for this DUS system. And um, there's some private hospitals. There's a very good, uh, excellent cancer treatment hospital called Lisod, uh, which is run by Israeli uh, physicians and Ukrainian physicians. And those are completely private. So. If you are a regular person in Ukraine, you can basically only use the public health system. You pay for a lot of stuff there, but that's what your access is. If you want to go to any of those other hospitals, if you want to go to the military hospital, you have to pay 100% for everything. They'll pay for nothing for you because you're not military. You can't even go to Felfania with the deuces because you don't have the right ID from the cabinet of ministers or from the Verkhovna Rada. So what the new medical system, the one that we're putting in place, does is we have the rule that the money follows the patient. So if I'm the patient and I want to go to Felfania, I can go to Felfania and the money comes with me. And Felfania needs to take the uh, payment from the national health insurer. If I want to go to the military hospital, the money comes after me. And if the military hospital says your operation costs 15,000 hryvnia and the government only pays 12,000 hryvnia, then I'll have to pay the extra three. But I get to choose the hospital that I go to. And if I want to go to a private hospital, the money follows me. The private hospital is maybe 20,000 hryvnia, but I want to go there. They have to accept and they have, well, they will accept the 12,000 from the, uh, minist from the uh, national health insurer, and then the patient will have to pay the difference because private hospitals are not going to be regulated by the ministry in the sense that we tell them what fees that they pay they or charge. 
Some private hospitals will actually probably charge the same fees as what the national health insurance does because we want to, it's going to be, now there will be competition between them because uh, at this point, the private hospitals, they only take fee for service. If there's going to be uh, uh, the payment from the national health insurance, then the private hospitals will attract patients to them. And what we're hoping is the private hospitals are usually better than the public hospitals, so we're hoping to bring up the level of care at the uh, public hospitals because they will be competing for the patients. So that's the difference uh, that will occur once the law is passed and the new health care financing is in place. Um, uh, what we're doing is we're, um, we're doing um, like super decentralization of health care. Um, instead of having the central government, which is kind of the way the Soviet system was, decide everything for the patients, decentralization passed the money along to the local authorities. But local authorities were deciding what hospital gets money, what hospital doesn't get money, what doctors get paid, what other doctors don't get paid. Instead, we're bringing, trickling that all the way down to the patient themselves. And the patient's legs will take will uh, designate where the financing goes. If uh, I choose you as my doctor because I think you're a good doctor, then the national health insurance will pay you. If I'm dissatisfied, I get to move, go to a different doctor, and now my, the financing will go to a different physician. The other thing that was always in place in Ukraine, which was a bit of a problem, is that um, uh, people register, they have their residency at some address in Ukraine. It's called a propiska. Um, all the uh, financing for citizens of Ukraine go to where they have their propiska. And say, Stas uh, Rishtishin, who's my chief of staff, he's from Ujhorod. Uh, the money, he's, he has his propiska in Ujhorod, but he lives in Kyiv and works in Kyiv. So the financing that supposedly goes for him goes to Ujhorod city and is then passed along to all the hospitals there. But he's in Kyiv. So if he goes to a hospital in Kyiv, the Kyiv hospital says, hey, we don't have any money for you. You have to pay for everything. So we're telling, uh, we've, we're changing that requirement, and we're saying that the patient chooses where they want to go regardless of where their propiska is. Maybe I live in Kyiv, but I heard there's a really good hospital or a really good doctor in Zhitomir. So I can go to Zhitomir, and that's where the health insurance will pay for my care. So we're freeing people from these sort of uh, shackles that they were tied to with their territory, first territorially with um, uh, where, they're, where they're registered. And secondly, we're freeing them to choose what doctor they want to see and what hospital they want to go to without us telling them which one that they have to go to. They get to choose on their own. Okay, great. I have a lot more questions, but we have 15 minutes and I want to make sure we, we get to yours. So hands. Um, Wait for a microphone, and uh, if you just identify yourself and your affiliation, if you have one, and then ideally end with a question mark. Yes, sir, in the light-colored suit there. Uh, good morning. My name is Will Center. I represent Philips. We're a very large uh, healthcare and well-being company, and I want to thank you very much for the fascinating comments this morning. I was wanted to know if you could comment a little bit about reforms and contracting. Um, we have been following a, a very large World Bank program, and we also are following reforms at the World Bank on how to better procure uh, technology. And this, of course, is important because while I very much appreciate the comments about uh, patient-centric medicine and, and, the, and the financing following the patients, you're still going to have infrastructure requirements and salaries to be paid. And so if you could say just a couple of words about contract reform and, and how uh, you can try to get away from uh, just paying for inputs, which is where a lot of corruption happens uh, when you're just buying for one piece of equipment or another, but rather to structure contracting where you might actually pay for uh, outputs or performance. Okay, and I think we'll take uh, one more and uh, let the doctor answer them together. Yeah, we'll take the gentleman here. Good morning. I'm Katlus Gankadze. I represent uh, Chemonix International. I recently served in Ukraine as a chief of party for strengthening tuberculosis project in Ukraine. So, which finished uh, in uh, March uh, 31st. Uh, so, and I regret that my project finished when you are the <laughs> active minister, because uh, one thing we did in uh, in Kiev uh, city department, and we assisted uh, uh, in terms of uh, services of tuberculosis, uh, because uh, parallel systems of uh, giving uh, tuberculosis services exist in Ukraine, and Kiev had uh, five hospitals uh, who would provide TB services, which they 
basically didn't need, but uh, that was a political issue, you know, just what to do with these hospitals. And uh, what we, we assisted uh, Kiev City Department of Health uh, in um, uh, drafting the project where they would reconstruct uh, one hospital and uh, we calculated number of beds and now they are basically reconstructing, bringing to the up-to-date uh, standards uh, according to the infection control. And uh, the rest uh, for hospitals, they will live uh, as a rehabilitation center or whatever. And uh, when I asked the city authorities that uh, we are moving forwards and you are demonstrating basically how you can do even within the existing system, and uh, the head of uh, health department basically in a humor, she said, but uh, Carlos, we cheated, you know, just uh, this was uh, not uh, quite uh, legal. And so what uh, you gonna do with these uh, issues uh, for in the countrywide context in order to make this legal? Okay, great. Uh, there was a law passed, yeah, there was a law passed recently uh, that we pushed through. It had sat in um, parliament for two years, 2309 that allows hospitals, public hospitals, to become non-profit corporations. That will change everything because they will no longer be government structures tied down with government regulations. They will then be able to lease equipment rather than having to buy all their equipment. They'll be able to then pool their needs and do procurement um, even within a whole hospital district or we're creating a national uh, procurement agency where they will be able, will be able to pool the needs and, and uh, do the purchasing through a national procurement agency. Um, this is the change that will happen that will allow hospitals to do the kinds of changes that you just described that technically were illegal um, in Ukraine, but a lot of the hospitals did them because it's the proper thing to do and you know, it's uh, much more efficient. Um, it also will allow the employees to have a higher salary because Ukrainian um, uh, because of the public health system was part of the government system, they were tied down to a, a government um, wage uh, wages. Doctors were not allowed to be paid more than 5,200 hryvni, that's less than $200 a month, because that's the wage for a doctor that's uh, designated by the government. Once they become nonprofit corporations, uh, the hospitals themselves will be administratively much freer to sign contracts, to increase wages, to optimize their systems so that there's less beds and more services provided on an outpatient basis. And it's something that will be very, uh, very positive for uh, efficient uh, use of uh, facilities and efficient use of financing. But we also will need, through things like the World Health Programs, we will need, uh, World Bank Programs, excuse me, we will need to have training of the management so that they understand how to do that. And that's a couple of the uh, World uh, Bank Programs are actually going through the training process as well as purchasing equipment. Uh, one quick note, um, we do national procurement of medicines and this year we have uh, 4.9 billion, uh, excuse me, 5.9 billion hryvnia in this program. We turned them over to international organizations because there was such a large amount of corruption that we had, uh, we weren't really receiving quality medicines at good prices because there were so many corrupt policies in place with the tenders, with the way that the purchasing was done, and with even the way the technical requirements were written for each of the medicines. So in 2015, a law was passed by parliament in a flash of brilliance to give this over to the international organizations. And in the last three, uh, last two, two and a half years, we've, um, saved uh, over $25 million in procurement, and we've also been able to provide higher quality medicines for more of our patients, as well as vaccines and other medical products. So that's a, also a very positive step forward, and those tender processes that occur through the international organizations don't allow for corrupt practice. Um, it has actually helped more Ukrainian businesses be involved, but beca because up until now the tender process was written in such a way that Ukrainian business wasn't even allowed to take part. They had to pay bribes to be able to get in through the tender process. Through the international organizations, it's an open playing field, and everybody is involved. So there's been 40% of the companies who won tenders last year had never even won a tender in Ukraine, although they're a Ukrainian company. So it's helping Ukrainian business as well as international business. Okay, we had more hands up. Uh, yes, a gentleman here in blue, and then uh, Isabella here. Just wait for the microphone if you can. And c the other hands, keep them high just so I can see how many we have. Yeah. Thanks, I'm uh, Jim McCann, affiliated with uh, Georgetown. And a long time ago, I had a pain in my abdomen, and I was about- Are you looking for free medical advice, Isabella? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it, the pain is gone. Uh, I she does charge by the hour, I well, <laughs> Well, I was, I, it so happened it was a very long time ago, uh, and 
I was about two kilometers from Maidan, so I was in Kyiv. So I knew a little bit of Russian, so I called the Soviet period. I called for Skorya Pomoch. They came, you know, the first aid, and they said, where does it hurt? How much do doctors make in the United States? I said, we're not here for sociology, you know, do something. I ended up in the hospital, uh, the appendix ruptured, but I, they saved my life. And uh, the thing was that there was one odd procedure called Bantuzi, you know, like cupping, which was a little strange, but aside from that, everything was fine, and I'm here to tell the story. The uh, certificate I had when I left the hospital said, date of release from hospital or date of death. But, but you know, underline, <laughs> underline one, luckily. Yeah. But I guess I, uh, my, oh, and at the end, um, since I couldn't lift a suitcase, they assigned me a, a babushka who would carry my, my uh, luggage uh, as I was leaving. So this was all kind of strange. And I didn't pay, so at the time, a copeck. My question is, um, uh, there was a woman, the surgeon was a woman. Are there, is the medical profession still dominated by, by women uh, these days in Ukraine? Um, a second question would be, do you have, is there a national health service as such? Is that what you're, you're uh, striving for? And then my last question is, um, have you changed the certificates for leaving the hospital? I'll do this quickly. There's a, uh, there are still a lot of women in medicine. Um, they tend to be more in the um, gynecologist, pediatrician, family practice, and nursing. And uh, there's a little bit more male domination as it is in, uh, in the United States when it comes to surgery, orthopedics, and so on. It's a lot more male dominated. So um, that's a, a difference um, than, it, than it had been during the Soviet times, I guess. I don't know. Uh, the other thing is, uh, have we changed those certificates? Yes. And uh, the, third, the third question was, uh, yes, basically we, the model that we're using is the British or Spanish or Finnish model, which is a national health insurance, national health th service that um, is basically sort of a billing agent for the budgetary funds. There's no additional, pool, there's no additional fund or pooling of, of, uh, of financing. We're using the money that's already been allocated in the budget for health care, and we're distributing it in a different, more efficient way. Basically, the NHS uh, model, yes. Do you have ID okay. cards as such? We haven't passed the law yet, so we still don't have a national health service, and we still haven't issued any ID cards, because the, the, we can't do it until we pass the law. Um, the other thing is that we're starting an electronic uh, health uh, 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 health system where you won't even need a card. You will just be able to come in and through the, your name and your date of birth, your uh, information pops up on the system and you're already registered. So there won't be sort of this additional um, having to find a policy or having to decide what you, kind of policy you want. Everybody will be covered the same no matter who you are. You're a citizen of Ukraine, you have permanent residency in Ukraine, or you're a refugee in Ukraine, registered in Ukraine. All of, everybody has equal access to the healthcare system. Okay, great. We have very limited time, and I, I wanted to get to Isabella and Judy at least, and if I don't get to all of you now, I, I apologize. I'm Isabella Tabarovsky from the Kennan Institute. I'm curious about the, what is the situation with HIV AIDS in Ukraine? We know that in Russia it's a serious epidemic, for example, they won't deal with um, at-risk population, do needle exchanges, etc. cetera. Um, what is it like in Ukraine at the moment? Um, there is still is a large uh, contingent of HIV positive patients, uh, but there's been quite a bit of inroads made since uh, the Maidan revolution, actually, because uh, uh, NGOs like Mareja Ludei Kizhvut Svil Snidom and others are very active in uh, targeting those populations. And they've actually had gotten, from the very beginning, they've gotten a lot of funding through Global Fund and through other USAID and other programs aimed at targeting those populations. Um, we are now working with them very closely. Uh, we're writing a new project or, or a new program for Global Fund where we'll do the purchasing of the medicines through the uh, state procurement agencies, and then they'll be distributing the medicines and doing the social programs with the high-risk groups. Um, we identify the high-risk groups and understand that they're there, and we want to help them. So we're reforming the penitentiary medical system. We're taking it into the Ministry of Health, and we're going to have Ministry of Health doctors, not officers from the penitentiary service being the doctors for the, sp for the prisoners. And we're providing access to the NGO so that they're able to get into the, uh, that target population. There was a huge problem when Crimea was taken over by the Russian Federation. 
when the little green men came in and uh, uh, took over, uh, they cut off all of methadone replacement treatment, which was a huge problem, and they also cut off a lot of the HIV treatment, which was coming from Ukraine. So we are trying to target those populations, the ones that we have in Ukraine. We're doing a lot of social program work with NGOs. We're also doing, um, uh, we have our own strategy for the next five years of how we will decrease uh, the um, transmission of HIV between uh, men who have sex with men and those who use, uh, who are narcotics abusers, IV drug abusers. There's also specifically another one in there because it started, there started to be a little blip in heterosexual transmission. So we're doing a lot of targeting communica communication on how to prevent disease using condoms and so on. And then the other thing that we, um, we really find is, is very helpful is that um, uh, the church, uh, the churches, not the Russian Orthodox Church, but all the other ones are actually quite helpful in getting this information out to their, uh, their, um, the people that come, the believers that come to their churches. And that's really helped us to make a difference. On the other hand, the Russian Orthodox Church follows that, which um, the Russian Federation is also doing, not admitting that those people exist and not wanting to give them medicines. Um, one piece of good news in 2016, there were no transmission of, no cases of transmission of HIV from mother to fetus at birth. So we have hit a huge milestone in Ukraine that uh, at this point uh, I think is really good news. We still need to work though a little bit more on decreasing the uh, number of HIV cases. We have a hepatitis C um, problem as well and it's uh, really bumped up because of the war. Um, the transmission rate is uh, a little bit different because of the usual things that happen with war. Um, also, uh, there's a very interesting, um, it's kind of fascinating for me, um, transmission problem that soldiers, they tattoo each other. And they share needles when they're tattooing each other. And they have had a transmission of HIV through tattooing. Um, there's the other, uh, uh, other, uh, well-known reasons why uh, HIV or why hepatitis C is passed along during wartime. And there's also a big issue that uh, we don't have access to those uh, citizens of Ukraine who are in the occupied territories. And we can't provide services for them and we can't provide, uh, we can't do monitoring of whether they're receiving services on the other side. Some of them do come across, receive help in the, on the Ukrainian side and then um, go back into the occupied territories, but we can't follow all the way through to the end. So we're working with uh, orga uh, humanitarian organizations, the ones that haven't been kicked out um, from the occupied territories so that they can provide services for um, those citizens that still are living there. And there was a very in important political decision that was made by the Global Fund, which is a UN program for the last three years, they have provided uh, treatment for HIV, hepatitis C, and tuberculosis to the occupied territories, Crimea and in eastern Ukraine, through an emergency program. But it was being done through the UN. In our 20, uh, 18, 19, and 20 program, um, they have, uh, they have um, admitted that those people are Ukrainian citizens. And the medicines and the help should be going through the Ukrainian government and not directly to them through the UN. So the treatment and the programs that are going for the occupied territories will now be going through the Ukrainian government to the citizens of Ukraine who are you know, currently under illegal occupation in both Crimea and um, the Eastern Ukraine. So I think that that politically was a very strong uh, signal from the United Nations that they admit that there's a war going on and there's an occupation going on and those sit people that are in those territories are Ukrainians and that uh, the services provided to them through, should be through the Ukrainian government. I have to say, it's, it's really, uh, as I listen to the, the, the many interlinked components of your presentation, it is really interesting and, and pretty unique, I think, to hear a description of a thoroughgoing healthcare overhaul as if, you know, as if in any normal country under normal circumstances, which are still difficult, plus a wartime health crisis, which interrelates to each of the pieces you talked about, public health especially, that, that is an unprecedented challenge. I mean, so kudos and, you know, keep working hard on it. I want to, I, I apologize, we're already over time, but I, I want to get in uh, Dr. Judy Twigg's question as the last one. I apologize to those of you that I haven't gotten to. Uh, maybe Dr. Sapoon has a few minutes afterwards to, to talk with you, please. Thanks, Matt. Um, hi, Dr. Sapoon. I'm Judy Twigg from Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond and the Center for Strategic and International Studies here in Washington. So two questions. One is, as the reform moves forward, as you've described it, 
it seems like there are a lot of people and institutions that will have to be retrained, reprofiled, um, think differently about how they do healthcare. You know, if you've got 80% of care happening through specialists and 20% happening through primary care, that's going to need to be flipped probably the other way around. Um, in other post-socialist contexts where hospitals have gone through this kind of reform, you've seen small rural hospitals have to close or be reprofiled. So how do you get people and institutions to shift to the new way of doing things more efficiently? And then second question is that after 26 years, um, there's been a lot of talk about reform. Um, especially a lot of conversation about the elements of reform that are in the current legislation going back to what, 2014, 2015. So how come it's finally gaining traction now? Why at this point in time? Acknowledging that the answer to the question might be awkward for you because the answer might be that it's you. Uh, <laughs> um, to the first question, um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, as much as possible, use the carrot rather than the stick. So what we're doing is we're encouraging for things to change. Uh, we uh, have established something called hospital districts. Uh, each of the oblasts is divided into very many districts, rayons, and each of those rayons had hospitals. So there are 800 hospitals in Ukraine that really we don't need that many for the population that we have. But there's usually in each oblast or each province, there's a single hospital that's, say, a level one trauma center that we would call um, here in the United States. So what we're saying is that we need to uh, provide services uh, territorially closer to the patients themselves. We're redoing hospital districts and each of the districts will now have a level one trauma center instead of having to go to the oblast center to get the services. So we're actually go uh, choosing those hospitals, uh, not us, but the regional governments themselves will choose the hospitals that will be the level one centers and we will be providing through budgetary funds investment financing for them to invest into those hospitals and keep them at the top level. So we're doing things to make things better. However, many local hospitals will need to be closed down because they're half empty, they're providing no services, and the services are of very poor quality. Um, their hospitals are falling apart, the infrastructure isn't there. So we're reprofiling. There are very many services not available in Ukraine. Rehabilitation, uh, addiction treatment, hospice care, there isn't any in Ukraine. So I actually even have an example from Sambir, which is in Lvivska Oblast. Uh, they came up, the deputy from there came up to me when I was in parliament fighting for our law. And uh, he said that, uh, you know, that idea you have about reprofiling, it really works. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, we had this local polyclinic and it had no patients and it was half empty and the, the personnel were sitting around not doing much. And it was very expensive for our rayon to run the place. And we saw that there's a need for hospice in our area. So we reprofiled it. We ha kept the personnel, but now they provide hospice care instead of providing polyclinic care. We made 30 beds. We fixed the place up. There's a line of 300 people for those 30 beds. So they go, now we're p picking all the other places that we're turning into these uh, hospice cares. So I think that there's a, a lot of, there's a great need. And once they figure it out, that it actually will be, uh, we're allowing them to do it on their own. We have uh, primary health care starting from the 1st of January 18, and we're not requiring everyone to go over into the new system until January 1st, 2020. But we're holding a lot of carrots in front of them so that they want to do this. Um, why is it happening right now? Um, there was a lot of work done until uh, before we came in. There was a strategic working group that made the con that uh, came up with uh, some of the concepts that we're pushing through now through law. There were, was a lot of work done with uh, convincing people. I can tell you that when I uh, started talking about healthcare reform in Ukraine in the summer of 2014 yet, we were talking about healthcare services. And everyone was saying, services, we're doctors. This is a calling. We don't provide services like a waitress. We're doctors. And then a year later, they were saying, well, you know, what kind of services are you guys talking about? And now they're saying, how much are you going to pay us for those services? So it's been an evolution over time. And I just think that it's come to the moment where we've had enough talk about it. We've had enough description about it. Um, one of the things is when I came into the ministry, uh, the when um, uh, the prime minister spoke with me and, and asked if I would be willing to come into the ministry and work on uh, the reform of the medical system, I told him I would, but only if I could bring in my own team. And I think that made a huge difference. And the current prime minister has allowed all of the ministers to bring in their own teams. 
So I think that having your own team around you and not having a bunch of political appointees who are actually undermining what you're trying to do rather than helping you has made a huge difference in not only health care reform, but it's going to help in the pension reform. It has helped in energy reform, and it's going to be helping in the land reform. Um, so uh, I don't know that it's me. I think that it has more to do with a team. So thank you for your questions. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm sorry I'm going to have to go. They're already signaling me in a big way that I have to get out of here. Thank you indeed, Dr. Supruna. And I think uh, when I introduced you and I said you're acting health minister, I should have put the emphasis on acting. And I hope it stays that way. So thank you so much. Thank you.